Welcome back to the Neighbors Podcast. On today's episode, we have Victor Meza. Victor served in the military for over 20 years. He was in the Navy and he had some crazy stories from his time serving in the military including he was a part of the rescue of Captain Phillips. And if you're thinking Captain Phillips, like the movie Captain Phillips, yep, that Captain Phillips. Yep, Victor was on the first boat that was a part of that rescue mission. And he tells the whole story, which is incredible. Uh, So he served in many capacities in the Navy. And that's where he discovered his faith and leaned into a relationship with Jesus. And it changed everything about everything, how he led, how he was married, the conversations he had with the guys on base. And there's just so many things he learned in that time that's applicable to anyone anywhere. Uh, And now he currently serves as the IT director. So he went from military leader, rescuing people from pirate ships to the IT director at the Church of 1122. Uh, And so to hear how his leadership skills have translated there and the way he approaches leadership way more from a place of serving others than getting something for himself is so inspiring. He is such a good time and he has so much wisdom to offer. So here's my conversation with Victor Meza. All right, Victor Meza, welcome to The Neighbors Podcast. Thank you very much. I'm so glad that you're here, and I think it's so funny because we were just talking before we pressed record. Next month, you're going to Sudan on a mission trip where you're going to encounter a lot of crazy things, and this scares you more than that. (laughs) For sure. So much more. Why? (laughs) Uh, It's, uh, I guess, talking. Talking? Uh, Talking about myself, uh, talking and then like things like this thing and stuff Into like things that. like microphones yeah, I'm like, mm. yeah, yeah you're, like you're willing it. that would be really weird yeah like, no holding uh, it no i know a lot of podcasts do that these days which no yeah. shade on any other podcast you do you but i see a lot of people holding podcast microphones and that yeah. just seems like it's just too much happening yeah. uh what are you gonna be doing in sudan uh we're gonna probably be doing some medical mission stuff and being super flexible for whatever's gonna happen and wherever God leads, that's what we're going to do. I mean, the primary focus is to help um, church planners there. And so mm. we're going to be. But you're kind of going as like the you're the ex-military. Yeah. Well, ninja. Mission, mission support is basically what they call mission it. Mission support, which is yeah. a loose term for warrior, well, soldier, they, bodyguard. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> we're we putting Band-Aids on and stuff like that. Band-Aids. So we'll be helping. You'll <laughs> be helping. Yeah. yeah. Um, OK, well, you traveled all over the world. You've probably lived, actually, a lot of places. I didn't ask you that before. Um, no, pretty much United States for the okay. most part. But you've um, traveled a lot. Traveled a lot. Where's your favorite place that you've ever been? Oh, there's, I, don't, I was thinking about just trying to figure out a favorite place because somebody else asked me that. I'm like, man, it's really hard to pick yeah. a favorite when you, place. When you sail the world for 20 plus for years. Sure. I mean, you see some really beautiful things all over the Mediterranean countries, mm. places like that. I really like the Middle East. I mean, a lot of folks Ooh, don't. Hot take. But um, you love like desert, dry. Yeah, I'm from Arizona originally, and so fair. It's a little bit close to that fair. from an environment perspective. But the people are amazing. They're really mm. like you meet some really great, sweet people that um, maybe they're not godly, but they're definitely about people. Yeah, and they love people and they have good really great too. families. Oh man, a good shawarma. Oh, yeah, so good, so good. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we already said, but you have a military background. You joined the Navy, gosh, what, 1995. Yeah. Does that make you feel a little bit old? That was like 30 years ago. Uh, now that you say it, probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You served for 23 years with 11 deployments overseas, which is, that's yeah. a lot. I mean, that's a lot. That's really impressive. First of all, thanks for doing that. Yeah. And um, what did you love about the Navy? And then what was hard about it? Uh, I really loved that... When you're in the Navy, you first come in, you really come in very inexperienced. Like, you have no real skills. You might have, like, I did construction as, you know, a teenager and stuff like that. Okay. How wait, how old were you when you went into the Navy? I was 19. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. you're so young. Yeah, very. I, you don't have really a whole lot of job experience or anything. And you come in and they teach you everything you need to be an expert in a field uh, very quickly. Mm. Um, I had two years of training and... I mean, you you go out into the fleet and then you don't know anything and then you get to the fleet and you become an expert very quickly because you kind of just get thrown into the the pit and you like have to do things and make things work, all that kind of stuff. And so you come out an expert, I mean, for the most part, and most military folks end up having 
so much life experience or expertise in an area that they can get a really great job mm. and not really go through college or do any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. What so. was your specific job? Um, I was a sonar technician on surface ships. Okay. And so what does that mean? My main job was to hunt submarines. But this is post-Cold wow. War, and so we don't really have a whole lot of submarine stuff going on out there. Oh, really? Yeah. It was, I don't this know. Is I don't like, know our current um, submarine you know, the, the status. The Russians <laughs> and Chinese and folks like that were, weren't as— um, They're more into, like, the bots yeah. than they are well, the submarines. It's more like uh, different types of warfare, not necessarily underwater warfare anymore. Got it. You know, okay. It's all about up in the sky. and. So did you find any submarines? Uh, every so often, okay. yeah, we would. Well, cool. Yeah, it was— was so, that like really exciting when you would find very one? Very much so. <laughs> like thrilling. Yeah, because you find one and you're like, oh my gosh. And you get to do it for, you know, hours and hours and hours on end. Like wow. no sleep because you're just so excited to like, I'm looking, yeah, I'm doing the thing. I'm doing my job. It's so crazy. Wow. Uh, okay, sorry. I interrupted you. No, okay, so then, what did you, maybe, well, is that what, maybe that's what you loved. What did you love? What was hard? No, I did love doing it, but it wasn't my primary job um, okay. for a long time. Because I did what they call visit board search and seizure, and so I did that for many years, like maritime interdiction operations, um, boarding ships. Yeah, some of that. Um, checking for contraband coming in and out of the Gulf oh, War after the Gulf wow. War happened, stuff like that. So. so is this like you see a ship mm-hmm. and you're jumping on it and getting the things you need to get? Yeah. Uh, it started this is out— like a movie. Oh, like back in the late 90s, there wasn't really a, a technique, and so— it just kind of. It was the wild, wild west. I had no idea. I was my very first deployment. My um, the guy who was in charge of me. We get across the Atlantic Ocean. We get on station over in the Gulf, and they call for this team, and they're like, "Hey, you new guy, go, go take care of this. Whatever they just called for." And I said, "Okay." I'm like, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to bring? It's like, just go. Just go and figure it out. So I get there, and they start handing me a gun, and they say, "Put these." like overalls on these like coverall things and you put on this life vest so you don't drown and then we go onto a boat and get onto a, another ship I'm like what is happening and so i get back i'm like that was a lot of fun like I what did do you that. do on the ship or can you not talk about it no we um we searched the ship there, there was intel that hey we, there's a ship coming in and out and so we had to go board it and check for contraband and wow. so we walked the entire ship we had to muster the crew like get them all together in one spot. did you like tie their hands behind their backs no to the we just pole? kind of put them in a little kitchen area because they were okay. back in those days it was compliant boardings and which means that they're totally compliant they're like yeah come and check okay. whatever do a thing and we were like give them a hat they're like hey thank you for cooperating <laughs> thanks for letting <laughs> yeah. us search your ship uh, and then we would leave and then as the years progressed and multiple war started and all of the special operations guys left Mm. And t- to go do that in the desert. And so we had to get trained in doing all the non-compliant stuff. And that's when I started to get a little bit more exciting okay. stuff. So it was Okay, which we'll get there because there's a fun yeah. story there. Okay, so. But the hard part. Yeah, so that's question. what you loved, though, yeah. the search oh, and seizure? That. Okay. Yeah, it was yeah that's thrilling. It was a lot of fun. A lot of cool training and a lot of places to go and do that kind of stuff. For sure. Um, I think the hard part was, even though it was amazing to travel all over the place, I've probably been to over 80 countries at least and um it's great it's amazing to see these places but you don't really have anybody to share it with Mm. like you have some buddies and you're like isn't this cool like yeah i want to go like have a drink we're like don't you see these amazing mountains or you see this incredible ocean or stuff like that and it just wasn't a thing and so like not having emily there or not having my family to show them Mm. and like experience that that was kind of hard yeah and i mean you're away from your family for yeah i mean uh we did some, most of the deployments were six months, but some of them were up to nine months. Wow. And so I was like, man, that's a long time. And this is when you have young kids or is this before? Yeah, okay. Both. Yeah. Yeah. The first couple of deployments, it was just me and Emily. And then um, after a while, of course, we have kids and I got to be there for shore duty for them for a little while. But then it's like, you got to say goodbye, off. especially the first time. Ugh. And then all those videos that they show, like when you get home and they're like doing all, oh my gosh, that is mm. the worst Seriously, and it was really great coming home, but it's also like, man, I'm so sad. And they're mm. hugging and crying and all it's the confusing things. Confusing feelings yeah. for sure. Okay, so what would you say when you look back on your military career? What would you say are the top three things that you learned? Yeah, um, I would say you can learn something from every leader, even a bad leader. Hmm. And so, That's great. Um, I've had both really, really great 
folks that have led me and it's great what you learn from them but you also learn from the bad ones mm -hmm. and so you learn what not to so do true. um in a lot of instances and so um that's definitely something um i think i've learned too in the navy uh, that at the beginning when i first started it was about me like i'm trying mm -hmm. to you know kind of boost my resume in the navy you, you do things for yourself you're trying to test really well and be number mm -hmm. one so that you can get advanced and all the things uh, but after a while, when you get into the ranks of chief and above, then that changes. It's not about you. It's about the ship as a whole and your mm -hmm. division that you're taking care of. And so after a while, it becomes not about um, what they can do for you. It's about how you can serve them. And so wow, yeah, that was a really great lesson going into ministry is how am I going to serve? Not I was about to say, that makes so much go. sense because yeah. I feel like that is exactly how you lead yeah. at our church now is how can I serve you, even though you're a top leader, but it's way less. What can I get from you? What, and how can I serve you? Sure. Which is a great leadership posture to have. Yeah. I think if you're not thinking about your folks, uh, I mean, what's going to get done? You're just going right. to keep doing what you're doing. And then when you're gone, you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm leaving the big old huge spot. Sure, that sort right. of thing. I'd rather leave and have somebody who's already been trained to do everything that I do. And mm. there's like no... Um, there's no skip of the beat. It just mm -hmm. keeps going. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing that I uh, really learned in the Navy was that um, you don't really appreciate what you have until you see other countries mm -hmm. and other places that don't. Um, and you really appreciate what you have back home, mm -hmm. uh, family and, I mean, resources and things that other folks don't have and beautiful places to sit and live and hang out and houses to live in mm -hmm. and cars to drive and all those things. Um, you just appreciate that way more sure. when you see the things all over the world and what other people have to go through. Yeah. I mean, it's totally different. Yeah. It helps ground your perspective probably yeah. to, yeah, I mean, it's very easy to get very comfortable here. Yeah. We say it all the time. I mean, American culture can be really comfortable and yeah. when you experience another culture and the joy a lot of people have in it. Yeah. Uh, it's really beautiful to have your perspective broadened of like, we have so much to be grateful yeah. for, you know? Well, that's a good point too. You do see some folks and they might, you might think, man, do you really live here? And you, and they're so happy. Totally. Like they're joyful in the things that they have or don't have. Like they don't even know what they're missing. So it doesn't matter to them. Right. And they still find joy in their friends and their family and food and good times. And for sure. All the, the stuff that really that. does matter. Yeah. It's really awesome. A cool, crazy concept. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so when you were in the Navy, what was the state of your faith at that time? Or what was your journey through knowing Jesus? And how did that play into your timeline in the Navy? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, I got into the Navy because there was uh, a lot of question about where am I doing in life? Why am I was running away from a lot. Mm. And so the Navy, I thought, was the way to get some answers. And faith was a big one because it was a really hard beginning part of my life. And going through that, I questioned a lot about who is God, mm. who am I with God and who am I without God? And I mean, I, I was born and raised Catholic, but we weren't very practicing. Mm. Uh, like it was the Christmas and Easter thing. Mm -hmm. uh, every so often we'd go on a Sunday. And so we didn't have a whole lot of faith. And so when, when I went to boot camp, one, because you got a little bit of time off, but I went to every service they had for every kind of really? religion. So I was like, oh, Muslim every service? Religion? I'm going to that one. <laughs> like, oh, so that's old. hilarious. And so I went to all of them just to, one, to get away because you didn't have to do some stuff. But two. <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, I have to go to my like, religious yeah, service. Like, <laughs> religious service, right, today? I feel, yeah, like, I like, feel <laughs> like you're practicing 10 religions. <laughs> yeah. It was so funny. So I was like, uh, I'm going to go to all of them because I was questioning what what is God. Sure. And. So in that, I started to dig into that a lot. And it wasn't until um, I'd been in a while, for sure not following anything Christian-like. And then Emily and I started to connect. And that's when we got married. We're like, we need to do something different. Mm. Based on our broken lives, parents' lives, all the things, we're like, we can't like mm. continue to do that. Like that old generational curse thing. We're like, we got to stop that. Mm, like, wow. let's break those chains and start our own journey under God. And it was way different then. And so that was wow. a huge How did you change. come to that decision together? It just happened? I mean, the oh, Holy Spirit, sure. of we're, course. Well, so she got pregnant and then we're like, all right, what are we going to do? We now like, it gets real. Out. Yeah. 
Um, and we had some folks in our lives that were speaking life into us and we didn't even know it. And we're like, mm. hey, you should come to church with me and things like that. And every so often we would go as like a checkbox. We're like, mm. yeah, yeah, well, let's just go because it's the right thing to do. And after a while, I was like, no, we want to go and we, we should go. Mm. And and then we started involving our kids in it. And that was when like, oh, wow, this is, this is the way. This mm-hmm. is amazing. So did you have a moment that you were like, okay, this is the turning point where I'm surrendering my life? Or was it just more slowly over time? Uh, no, it was definitely a moment. Um, it was in service. I was at a church and it was just an overwhelming mm. feeling of this is right. And like, I didn't get emotional very much and I was so emotional. Oh, wow. Like, yeah, this is something. Sure. And, um, I was encouraged because Emily was way more mature in her faith than I was very quickly. Mm. And so watching her and her being my guide was probably the bigger wow. reason why I was like, yeah, I should probably catch up. Mm. Uh, I was gone a lot and I wasn't around her as much. Right. I was on deployments all the time. And so every time I would try to connect in that way, I was like, all right, it's mission focused time. Got to mm. go. And I would step away from faith because I was in the Navy. It was almost like the... That whole what happens in the Navy stays in the Navy. And so mm. you you're go and you kind of compartmentalize your life around that. Yeah. And you forget about faith. You forget about family. You forget about that kind of stuff. Just try to focus on what's going on mm. there. So you have to switch your mentality around and say, well, God needs to be a part of that too. Mm. So was that really countercultural to the Navy culture to oh, yeah. live a life following Jesus? For sure. <laughs> was that yeah. hard? Very, okay. very much so. Especially once you become a Christian, you're like, cool, let me find my Christian buddies. We're like, well, there's not oh. that many. Like, and, yeah. you know, everybody who already knows you, it's like, oh, I knew you before you were a Christian and you weren't like this. And you weren't like, well, yeah, I'm trying to be better. Yeah. You're like, well, you're let's go helping. drinking. <laughs> let's go do this thing. I'm like, no, I don't feel like doing that anymore. Mm. I'd rather not do that. And so it was for sure countercultural. And it was a lot of friendships lost in that especially at the beginning when I was, Mm. you get really tight with people really quick when you change from command to command Yeah, and you're there for three to five years. And so you build close connections super quick. And then for you to change midway through that and try to build friendships again is kind of difficult. Well, I feel like that's something not a lot of people talk about probably too, because well, it's predominantly male too. And I feel like male friendships are already difficult. So yeah. then to throw that in of this layer of, I feel called to live a different kind of lifestyle yeah. that then might make other people feel guilty about the choices they're making. Yeah. So then they don't want to be around you. I mean, that's just a layered. Yeah. So then you're kind of isolated, which we know the enemy loves to isolate believers because For if you, sure. if he can isolate us, then he can get our eyes off of Jesus. And so that would be a really hard environment yeah. to maintain that endurance of faith. And you're, you're what you're doing, you're, you're constantly on duty and you're on watch and you're doing the thing. And so when you come into port or even when you're not, you're always focused on what's that flesh mm. stuff that you want, the worldly things that any kind of joy or comfort, you're like, I want that thing, no matter what that is. Uh, it's like escapism in a way. Sure. And I, and I think it's highlighted in the Navy because it's such a unique environment that you're in. Yeah. But if we look at anybody, really, if you're doing something that's intense or something that requires a lot, then escapism and whatever that looks like for people, it could be binging Netflix. It could be binging alcohol. It could yeah. be sleeping around it could be isolating yourself for days and not talking to anybody like whatever your vehicle of choice is we're all it all ends up being escapism in a way and that's it's a dangerous place to live in just a constant cycle of that and the navy doesn't build in things like spiritual growth and things like that Mm -hmm. into the environment it's more about comfort like they have these little areas where you can watch TV and it's got couches and you yeah, that mm. sort of thing. And it's not like we're watching great shows where it's like, oh, there's movies and there's some stuff, you know, that escapism. Mm-hmm. And if it's not that, you have like this rack where you get to sleep and that's like your little 
hole where you pull a curtain and that's your privacy. Mm. That's like your little area. And so you end up being in that area. Like, I'm just going to sleep right now and just lay here and do that sort of thing. But nobody's going, hey, I'm going to read the Bible right now. Mm, so right. if you can like not disturb me, right. yeah, that sort of thing. <laughs> like, hey, I'm going to read a book or I'm watching this movie in my rack, that sort of thing. Mm. You want to isolate yourself from everybody else to have their own little escape. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a dangerous place to, because yeah. really at the root of it is you're trying to numb something For sure. yeah. because something isn't in alignment. And again, I think this is true for anybody. When something is out of alignment, sometimes it can feel like the harder thing to do is to actually work on it and yeah. center it and get to the root of what is out of alignment? Why am I feeling this itch to yeah. numb with something else? But of course, the easy thing is to just keep numbing the symptom, to just yeah. keep numbing. Well, if I can just get to that place where I can just get on my couch and watch the show and not have to think about my day, it's like, okay, well, that should actually be a yellow light blinking that on the dashboard of there's something you need to address that you're trying to numb or escape from instead of just fill, fill with these easy mm -hmm. creature comforts. For sure. And like, I agree 100% that you, you, there's so many different outlets that the enemy uses to grab a hold of you and military bases aren't built with like, Hey, here's some churches around us right outside mm -hmm. the gate. It's more like strip clubs and bars right. and um, that sort of thing. It's like, what other need can I fill by just walking off base? Because most military folks, especially when you first start out, you don't even have cars. So you get to a military base, and the only thing to do is walk off base to go find something to do. Mm. And if the closest thing right outside the gate is a bar, then you're going to drink. Right. If and, yeah, let's call a spade a spade. The Realistically, <clears throat> escapism might start as laying on the couch watching Netflix, yeah. it can quickly turn into laying on the couch and watching porn. Yeah. It can turn from having a drink at a bar to drinking yourself into oblivion. Right. It's it's just, it, it is such a slippery slope once you start. And there is real danger and real sin that is trying to kill you yeah. down the path of, let me just numb this because it's comfortable and it feels good. So what advice do you have for the person that is like, yes, I feel that. I feel like there's this lion in the corner staring at me and I just keep feeding it. How do they fight that temptation to feed the, the comfort? Yeah, I would say continue to find the opposite of that in anywhere. There's always somebody else you can come to that's like feeling the same way. Mm. Like I would, I would find dudes who were on the ship and felt the same way and did had no idea mm. and we've had really great conversations because that's what you do a lot of when you're sitting for four to eight hours on a watch together and you're sitting next to each other for long periods of time you have long conversations mm -hmm. about stuff we well, start to find out a lot but ask the questions like how are you on your faith do you believe in christ things like that not hey so what did you do this week and what are mm -hmm. you going to do when we go into port it's more like, hey, man, let's talk about the really deeper things. Mm, and it's okay so to ask that question. I think a lot of people shy away from it, especially in the military, because religion is just not a thing that is constantly pointed to. It's always about, like, other stuff. Mm. It's almost taboo sometimes. And it's okay to talk to other people about that. And it's okay to dive into that and say, hey, let me invite you to a Bible study we're having. Sure. And not feel like you have to be afraid to say those things. Right. Because a lot of people are. Yeah. And in any work environment, I can't tell you the, the amount of stories I've heard from people of a coworker inviting me to church. Yeah. I, I just had, we just had Ron Armstrong on the podcast and he's like, yeah, I was on a, a military ship and the crane operator said, Hey man, you want to come to church with me this Sunday? Yeah. Uh, I think the work environment, while it feels taboo to talk about your faith, ends up being a huge mission field where yeah. people are discovering God for the first time all the time, which yeah. it's funny because we make it taboo. And then when you actually get into the heart of it, like what you're talking about, when you actually take the step to talk about it, what you'll find is people are actually typically more receptive to it mm -hmm. than you would think that they are because yeah. everybody is searching. Everybody yeah. is searching for what is the purpose of my life? Why am I here? And where am I going after I die? Yeah. And if you can be the one to open up that conversation, then you just have no idea what God can yeah. do with that. And to that point, more likely than not, when somebody's in trouble in the military, they're looking to a person who has faith. Yes. So they don't go to the person that doesn't and say, right. I need help. 
they're going to the person like, hey, man, this guy's always talking about God. I should probably go yeah. and talk to him. <laughs> yeah. And they're the ones that end up counseling each other and helping each other through the tough moments. So yeah. my wife cheated on me and I'm thousands of miles away and I don't know what to do. Mm. I'm like, well, let's talk about that and let's pray about it. You're like, pray? I've never prayed before. I'm like, no problem. I'll pray for you. Let's do that together. So did you become that person? Oh, yeah. We had yeah. a lot of those kind of conversations. <laughs> yeah. You were pastoring before you even got sure. into ministry. I had no idea. I had no idea. There were, was, people just ask all the time, like, why are you so happy? <laughs> like, bro, let me tell let you. Let me tell you. I would love to tell you. <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, that's beautiful. And I hope anybody who's listening hears that wherever you are, you can be the yeah. beacon of light on the hill. And even if, even if it feels really dark, wherever you are, everyone's looking for the lighthouse yeah. and we can be the lighthouse to people. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Before we move out of talking about the military, cause there's so much else to your story. <laughs> uh, you've got to tell us an abbreviated version of how you were a part of rescuing <laughs> Captain Phillips. And yes, okay. if you're listening, I'm talking about the movie that was made. Victor should have been in the movie. I don't know about but that. But even better, you were in the real thing. So, okay, yeah. tell us the abbreviated version. Was it just like Hollywood told us it was? It's pretty close. Uh, Wild. I mean, Pirates the timelines are, are a little bit funky and things like that. And obviously, they don't tell all the details, uh, which I won't either. But um, <laughs> it was very close. Uh, we were happened to be in the area. We were doing anti-piracy operations in some off the coast of Somalia. And we got the call that... The Merck, Alabama had been hijacked, and so we zoomed off to see what we could do. Uh, we did find the Merck, Alabama. Uh, unfortunately, Captain Phillips was already gone, <laughs> and so the lifeboat had already left. Um, but we were able to help the crew, and we had to leave a team behind there of VBSS guys to get them escorted back into the country safely. And then we were able to catch up to the lifeboat. Um, we were able to blockade them from going into Somali territorial oh, waters. Oh, when you said Captain Phillips was already gone, like the pirates stole him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was already gone. He was fleeing. Yeah, they were they were trying to get to Somali territorial. We have no jurisdiction in territorial waters, oh, wow. only in international waters. And so they were trying to get to a point where we couldn't get to them. But unfortunately— So you were in a high-speed chase. Well— High speed is not <laughs> medium speed chase. So, like we're really slow. <laughs> slow like speed. we're like, chasing a turtle and we're trying to are you make the serious? turtle because these boats are so slow. I mean, they are <laughs> the slowest. So it's thing. like so thrilling, but oh you're my like, gosh. okay, we're, right. we're gonna get there. <laughs> are we you can moving? see him. <laughs> I can't even tell if you're moving. Are you moving? You're like this is cork bobbing in oh, the ocean wow. and it's going like burr, 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 burr. <laughs> like just the slowest. We're almost thing. gonna you're get like, him. <laughs> and. You just waited out, and we, we did. We waited out until he lost all his fuel, and so when they lost all the fuel, uh, we were able to, you know, trick them, I guess if you want to put it that way, to connect them so that w they wouldn't bob around as much. Because the only thing that keeps you when you're on the ocean and you're on a ship, as soon as you stop the engines, you start just bobbing and mm. weaving, and it's not very comfortable. You start getting seasick pretty quick. Most people, especially non-experienced sailors, and so they were not feeling great. And these were all young Guys, I mean, the Somali guys were less than 18 years old. Do they have, like, old. eye patches on? Like yeah, pirates? I wish. No R. Peg nothing, legs? No. No cool language. <laughs> no nothing hook, like hook that. No hands. Like, none of that. I mean, they don't have any treasure so chests. No, you wouldn't, okay, that yeah. would have been the best. A find, a find a treasure chest. Like, oh, cool. Gold. <laughs> <The> treasure <blues."> chest. <laughs> nope. Didn't find no, any okay. of that stuff. And so. Um, just criminals. We, we had to, yeah. And loosely criminals. I mean, these are just kids. Mm. And they're just trying to get a way to make money and so mm. I mean, most of them were being manipulated from you know warlords and stuff in the country or like hey if you want to live and you want oh, your wow. family to live then you need to go make money and well, it's like go a form it of this trafficking way. for sure so it's it's a form of servitude in some way wow towards these warlords that needed money and so they would go out in boats and they would chase after ships and if they were able to find them and whatever country they were able to get money out of they were able to mm. live like kings if they did that sort of thing and yeah. so there was there was a method to her madness um yeah. and so these were young guys and they just didn't know any better they were raised this way mm -hmm. and so we were um able to blockade them we hooked them up to our ship and then um we would pull them along beside us or behind us to keep them from bombing but every night we would slowly reel them in inches at a time until we got to a point where we were able to take shots so, wow yeah. That is so, wild. Yeah, and then was, Captain Phillips great. came onto your boat yep. and you saved him. Yeah. Wow. 
not me, but the Navy in general. Well, did, yeah. you're part of it. The Navy did a great wow, job. Wow, that's that. in, that's an incredible story. I yeah. mean, that's one you're like. Yeah, I mean, I did probably close to 500 boardings in 22 years, 21 years. And this was the only one that made a movie. I was like, man, there's so many others. We should have made movies of all these. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hollywood, take note. I'm sure they're <laughs> listening to this podcast. So, um, okay. So let's talk about your family. So how did sure. you and Emily meet? And you talked a little bit about how your faith kind of came together, but give us a little context of what your backgrounds were and how, yeah. how you came together. I met Emily. So my dad worked for her dad's construction company. And so Every summer and any chance on the weekends, things like that, I would work with my dad. And so the construction company business was out of the back of his house at the time. And um, I first met her when I was walking from the front of the house to the back. They had a pool, and she was sitting next to the pool, and I said, that's my wife. <laughs> wow. She's the one I'm going to marry. <laughs> so love I that. Love it first as sight. soon as I saw her. She did not fall in love with me right away, <laughs> and so it was fine. And uh, you were not sitting by totally the pool fine. looking like a model, apparently. Yeah. She was amazing. And I was like, wow, oh, I really want to do it. I want to have that wife. And so wow. um, she ended up actually being the first person that had a license for uh, the two of us. And so she had a truck and I would have to help her be the gopher. And I would pick up the materials and load them up. And then she would drive us to the site and I had to unload them. And so that's how we met. Wow. We knew each other for a few years. And then in high school, we dated for a little while. And then she turned me down and said, <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> like, not really in that that bad. But it was, um, we just kind of separated. Hmm. She was going to college in a different part of the state. I started to go to college. Um, so we were in different areas. Then I, I lost a scholarship, and so I couldn't do that anymore. And went in the Navy, and so we were apart for a long time. We kind of kept contact when I was back and forth. And I happened to be on leave for Christmas one time and texted her and she's like, oh my gosh, how crazy. I just, my boyfriend's all crazy and I'm not doing that anymore and I'd love to connect. And we ended up um, just connecting in a way and having a long distance relationship for probably over a year. Oh, wow. And then she moved to Virginia with me and had to experience all that of me wow. being on deployment and being her being by herself and all the things. Um, and then we got married in two thousand and right after um, everything started to go crazy. Um, like right before 9-11, we got married and then everything went mm -hmm. like, hey, 9-11, what wow. are we going to do? And so we had connected then and been ever since. Wow. Yeah. And you didn't cut, you came from pretty broken homes, both of yeah, you growing both up? Yeah, of us. Yeah, her <clears throat> parents got divorced at a young age. Um, my dad's been divorced many, many times now. And so both of us had come from broken homes. Um, both our moms and dads had all kinds of stuff going on. And mm -hmm. so it was really hard for both of us. And so we, I think we connected in that way, maybe. Mm, sure. Um, and we loved each other really, really well. So it made it really easy. Uh, she needs to come on the podcast. For she sure. is a trip. Yeah, and she's she awesome. would be hilarious on here. She's so funny. Um, okay. So part of your story a big part of your story is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And uh, I called you a professional in forgiveness, which I know you don't like that because the Lord has forgiven you. And so you're forgiving others. I get it. But you've had to walk through some serious forgiveness stories. So can yeah. you give us some context to those and then how how you yeah. were able to get to a place of forgiveness? Yeah, and I'm still in that place of forgiveness. Um, I was abandoned really early um, for my mom. And so I still kind of hold a grudge mm -hmm. sometimes, even though I think I've said it out loud and I've told her I forgive her. Um, you have a relationship with her now? Um, yeah. Okay. Ish. Um, I try. Um, <coughs> I still hold some kind of animosity towards some things. And maybe that's just me trying to still work through that. And God's doing a thing through yeah. all that. Well, I think that's, so. That's going to be comforting to a lot of people to hear that yeah. even when you say the words out loud, I forgive you, it doesn't mean that you don't have feelings yeah. of sadness or hurt or anger. It doesn't mean those feelings never arise again. Right. Uh, that's, I feel like, kind of a false narrative of forgiveness that, well, once you say it out loud, you're never allowed to feel anything about it ever again. Right. But that's not the reality because we're humans and it's never going to be right. fully restored until we're on the other side of eternity. Um, sure. But you can take steps in freedom so that you're not living in bondage to that unforgiveness yeah it doesn't mean you're not going to have occasional feelings yeah, so towards true. the person yeah and i mean that the rainbow doesn't just start appearing after you say okay we're all done right. forgiveness is great and everything's happy 
like there's still stuff to work through and maybe like you said it might not ever get resolved here Mm -hmm. and um so that was a big part of my story from initially and then when emily and i were going to get married um we had a, a moment about nine days before the wedding, and it was supposed to be on his property, this big ranch. Uh, they on built her dad's. On my, her dad's ranch. My two of my brothers and my dad built this giant bridge over a pond that they made. I mean, it was going to be an amazing wedding. There's like 300 guests supposed to arrive, all the things. And then nine days prior, he said, "Hey, I need to see you." And we were staying in one of his rental properties, and she was working for him at the time. I was still in the navy obviously. And then, um, he said, I don't want you to marry him. He said, what, what happened? He's like, well, he's Mexican and I don't think that's a good thing for wow. you to marry a Mexican. We're like what? And so he gave her the ultimatum of like, it's either us or him. And so she came nine home days before the nine wedding? days and she was crying. I'm like, what's happening? So my dad just basically said, I have to choose him or you. I'm like, what'd you say? (laughs) Yeah, right? You're like, so... Am I leaving? (laughs) Do I need a pack? And um, now she said, well, obviously I choose you. I'm like, okay, well, what do we need to figure this out? And so we ended up having that day move out of a house that we had lived in, um, quit her job, moved into a condo with my mother-in-law and lived in like a one-bedroom part of it. Uh, I mean, everything just changed uh, but God was in it, and that's really where both of her and I saw God move in a huge way to make all these things happen. Within nine days, incredible family came around us. We were able to afford a wedding that we could not afford. Mm. Uh, God moved mountains, literally, like we were. We got married on the top of a mountain in a place mm. that we would had no idea we were going to get married. Really, really close family and friends were there. Um, I mean, we were able to start a life that we mm. didn't think we were going to be able to do without all the things that we had going on. And so um, it was a lot of hard stuff. And then in that, um, it was hard to forgive his words and his actions. And for 10 years, Emily's like, we're just not going to be a part of that. Mm. And then God in church just said to her, you need to call your dad. Wow. And so she started the process of reconciliation. And in that, he, his life started to change medically. He had a whole bunch of medical issues and I ended up being there with him through a lot of it and holding his hand next to him when he died and stuff like that. And so there was a lot of forgiveness and I, I pray that he is in heaven and, and is doing totally different in his life because of the forgiveness that we were able to, to just do with that whole situation. Like we had no idea it was going to turn out the way it turned out, but. How did that, did that affect you for a period of time before you were able to get to forgiveness, like that level of prejudice, that line in the sand that felt like you're not even considering my character. You're just, you're literally just considering my culture and my ethnicity. Yeah, it was, and I had not experienced that level of racism in a long time, especially since joining the Navy. Because the Navy is full of In your primary relationship. Yeah, and I'd worked for this man sure you you had a relationship and as a teenager i had lots of relationships he was my dad's best friend my two brothers were working for him like well and the wedding wasn't a surprise not at all like a two-year engagement like it wasn't Mm. a surprise and Mm. i don't know if the realization to him came up and all of a sudden he changed his mind like i didn't think you were gonna actually go through with it type of thing um and so it was weird having that be the thing Mm. that was the turning point. Not that I wasn't good enough or that I didn't have enough money because I was in the Navy still. That I could understand. Yeah, I can totally understand that (laughs) stuff. That was easy. Oh, man, I'm not rich. You're right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen with that. I'm still going to be in the Navy for a long time, so we're not going to make a lot of money. (laughs) And then I'm going to go work for a church. (laughs) Like, Yeah. Oh, man, if he would have saw that back in the day. And so that was really hard because I hadn't experienced any form of racism like that since I was a kid. Mm. And so it was way different from that aspect, like that being the one thing Mm. was hard to reconcile initially. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it just never was a thing when we used to have conversations after Hmm. it's like, I guess it's not a thing anymore. Oh, it just kind of faded. Like, Nope. He loved me and I loved him and my dad and him were still best friends. And wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So you just had a weird moment there nine days before the wedding. 
Just a flash, I guess. I yeah. Um, okay, so what surprised you walking through the process of forgiveness? Uh, I think the biggest thing that surprised me was how um, amazing God is in restoring relationships that are really broken. Mm. Um, God, through any so of the forgiveness stuff that's happened with anybody, but that one particularly was like we had a really great ending to his life. Mm. The last part of his life was great that we were able to be there with him and enjoy time with him. Um, that he got to see his grandkids, mm. that sort of thing. Um, so be able to have a restored relationship um, and not have to worry about the heaviness of forgiveness or the heaviness of the thing that happened. Like it wasn't ever a thing. I never had to bring it up ever. Mm. Or like, let's talk about this thing. Like it wasn't a thing. Mm. Yeah. So it was really great. So how do you still on the days that you wake up and you, you feel those feelings towards anyone that you've walked through forgiveness with, what is the process then? How do you work through that when those feelings come up? I think the biggest thing is I have to pray about it and I have to let God work in me through that because it's not their fault. Mm. Come on. Like it's me that needs to work through it. And so for me, it's constantly getting the reminder that God needs to work in me through that forgiveness and continue to heal whatever's not healed yet or forget whatever I need to forget that sort of thing. Let go of the, the hurts mm. that are not nearly as important as a relationship. Mm. Like none of this stuff really matters. What really matters is relationship. Mm. And so I think that's the biggest part is like I have to work through that. Yeah. The the saying about forgiveness is it's like drinking the poison thinking it's going to kill the right. other person. And yeah. even just hearing you talk about Emily's dad being able to live out the rest of his life really well and you getting to be a part of that you had every reason to hold that against him yeah. I mean blatant racism you know like right. but yet there was freedom for you to let that go and to not let it eat away at you and then to be able to look back now with so much closure and peace as he finished his life you don't have to harbor any kind of thoughts of I should have, I should have, I should have right. done it. I should have done this. I should have done that. And yeah, I just think there's a lot of freedom in that. Yeah. There's so many people that think it's more important to be right. Mm. And then say, I forgive instead of just letting go mm. and going, I just want to restore the relationship. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Okay. So you've had a lot of life experiences. How, do everything, everything you've been through, how do you see that play out in how you lead and love people now as a leader and shepherd and just this ministry presence um, at our local church, but just in, at the church as a whole and to people as a whole? How does it change or how did it impact how you lead and love? I think kind of like what I said before, I think serving is a big part and sometimes a sacrificial serving to your, your own wants or mm. comforts or any of those type of things. And um, I think continuing to serve was probably the biggest part of it. And not just like I'm good at a thing and I want to serve in that because it's easy. Like even doing the things that God presents in front of you and taking advantage of those things that you might not have any idea how to do. Like mm. I don't have any clue about IT stuff when I started IT. I had no formal really? training. I've never been in school for IT, uh, nothing. <laughs> and so when they say God equips. They're like, yeah, he was, he was hunting submarines and pirates. Yeah. Surely he can figure out IT. I mean, the person interviewed me like, are you sure? IT director? Like I can fix a couple of things because I have a hobby of working on computers. But I have no IT experience to run an IT infrastructure or wow. IT administration system. I had none of those qualities or skills. And so God has just given all of that and led my hands and feet and all of it. Cause wow. And I wouldn't have stepped into it if it wasn't for God saying, you just got to go through the door and start. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot there we could unpack yeah. uh, if we had more time because being able to say yes to something that you just didn't know about that even in of yeah. itself probably came from all your life experiences of entering yeah. into situations that you didn't know what to expect and you had to problem solve and figure out on the ground in the moment. Oh, for sure. And then saying yes to a job that you didn't have yeah. any actual training for. Um, but everybody that knows you knows what kind of leader you are and it's not that you, I mean, now you know so much about IT, but 
it wasn't the content that you needed to know because that could have been learned, but you have the things that can't be taught all the time, which is that natural inclination to serve everybody around you. And you lead so well, you lead your team so well, your family so well. And, uh, yeah, you're, you're such a, you are, you are a leader I look up to for so many reasons. Um, and it's, it's so cool to hear your story and how now I, I can put all the pieces together. And I like to think that about my own life, that even the experiences that I felt maybe far from God or were hard seasons in my life, it's your story is helping me look at that. Like that's a piece of the puzzle that who knows in 10 years, whatever I'm leading yeah. or doing or whoever person I'm caring for, God might use that experience in that moment to care for that person. Yeah. There's so many people in the Navy and used to hear it all the time when I first started that Navy stood for never again, volunteer yourself. And I'm like, no way, man. Like volunteer wow. for everything. Volunteer to try. I mean, even dip your toe in it, mm. try to figure it out. And so um, letting God lead you in every one of those things, you'll be surprised where he takes you. Volunteer to try. I love that. Yeah. It's going to be my new motto. Yeah. Okay, Victor, you've been to over 80 countries. Last question. Is it on your life bucket list to visit every country in the world? Oh, I wish. That would be amazing. Have you ever been to Sudan? Will this be another new country nope, on your list? In and you've been it. there? In and around it. So this will be the first time oh, in, okay. in Sudan and South Sudan. So. Oh, wow. Okay, so two more to add yeah. to your list. Well, I can't thank you enough. Thank you for coming to share. I know speaking yeah. to a microphone is not what you... It's not your favorite thing that you want to wake up on a Friday morning and do, but you did it yeah. and you said yes. Yeah. And I just really appreciate it because I think a lot of people, especially anybody with a military background, anyone walking through some unforgiveness, I think this conversation is going to help them a lot. So I just yeah. thank you a lot. I thank you. It's awesome. Love it. Neighbors is produced by Logger Creative and Taylor Minning. Music by Austin and Lindsay Adamak. Artwork by Wesley Parsons. And motion graphics by Robbie Burns. Robbie Burns.